Welcome to this Haymarket Live event. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Anthony Arnov. I'm the editorial director of Haymarket Books, and we could not be more excited uh, than we are to have our two distinguished guests for this important conversation. Uh, I'll just say that I think the single two most important books to understand our current political moment in all of its rich complexity are, are the two books that are uh, the subject of today's conversation. I will say a few words about our, our two speakers and our format, and then um, we'll uh, get off to the races. Naomi Klein is the award-winning author of international bestsellers, including This Changes Everything, The Shock Doctrine, No Logo, No Is Not Enough, and On Fire, which have been published in more than 35 languages. She's an associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of British Columbia, the founding co-director of UBC's Center for Climate Justice, as well as an honorary professor of media and climate at Rutgers University. Her writing has appeared in leading publications around the world, and she is a columnist for The Guardian. Her newest book, published September 12th by FSG, is Doppelganger, A Trip into the Mirror World, which is a New York Times bestseller and a New York Times notable book of 2023. Vincent Bevins is an award-winning journalist and correspondent. He's covered Southeast Asia for The Washington Post, reporting from across the entire region and paying a special attention to the legacy of the 1965 massacre in Indonesia. He previously served as the Brazil correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, also covering nearby parts of South America. And before that, he worked for the Financial Times in London. Bevins is the author of The Jakarta Method, Washington's anti-communist crusade and the mass murder program that shaped our world. His newest book, published October 3rd by Public Affairs, is If We Burn, The Mass Protest Decade and the Missing Revolution. We're possibly going to have some time for questions after uh, Naomi and Vincent speak and uh, have some dialogue with one another. Um, if there's going to be time for that, uh, it would be at the end of the program. So feel free to throw any questions you might have into the chat. Uh, and we'll consider those uh, depending on how the conversation is going, if time allows. Uh, to kick off, each uh, Vincent and Naomi are going to speak for around five minutes about their books uh, and then have a dialogue. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Vincent. Okay, thank you so much to everyone who's involved, everyone who's invited me, to Naomi, uh, to Haymarket. Um, I imagine this is something that uh, Naomi might hear often, but I first read her book, her first read, started reading her books in high school. I think I put this uh, in the beginning of, of my new book, if, you, if, if we burn, so I'm, I'm truly honored and grateful. Um, so what I'll do, yeah, is I'll, I'll try to explain where If We Burn came from, um, what it tries to do, and then look forward to hearing the same uh, for Naomi and then uh, having a conversation about the two works, because I think they both choose quite interesting and unique ways of coming at the world, um, very different ways of coming at the world and indeed uh, different parts of the world, but we end up in, in a lot of overlapping places. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So If We Burn is a book about mass protests and their unintended consequences. Um, this is a story which is personal to me. Um, in 2013, I was working as a foreign correspondent in Sao Paulo, the largest city in South America, covering a set of protests organized by anarchists and leftists against the rise in the bus fare in that city. Um, they had organized four protests, uh, uh, three protests, which were quite successful at shutting down the city streets, but had not convinced the establishment and certainly not the media in the country um, to come over to their side. On the morning of the fourth protest, Brazil's media called for a crackdown on these on these protests, and the crackdown came. Uh, the brutal repression that went viral very quickly, and I think it is notable, um, also hit journalists like me and people that I know in Brazil's media, went viral, shocking uh, 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 many people in the country. And Brazil's media changed their approach to what was happening on the streets. They went from saying, this is a group of punks and anarchists that we need to clean off the streets, to this is a patriotic uprising in defense of the right to rise up in defense of something. Um, and as millions of people came onto the streets, they came into the streets with a new ideas as to what was happening in the streets. 
uh, these new arrivals entered into verbal and then physical conf confrontation with the original organizers, the leftists that had been on the streets uh, for the first four protests. And eventually, these new arrivals that we could now recognize as the beginnings of a far-right movement in Brazil, as the beginnings of the Bolsonaro movement in Brazil, um, violently expelled the original organizers from the streets just a few days after this, this shift in public opinion. Now, in this strange pressure cooker of June 2013 in Brazil, uh, in this strange ball of energy that is unleashed onto the streets and, with, and that nobody knows what to do with, including the original organizers, Various groups and movements are born, which help to, over the next few years, call for the impeachment of democratically erected, democratically, democratically erected, sorry, one more time, democratically elected uh, President Dilma Rousseff, who was the first woman president of Brazil. They called for, they helped to support a movement which put Lula in jail, and then they ultimately helped to elect Jair Bolsonaro in 2018. So jumping forward five years, it appears that the people of Brazil asked for one thing on the streets of June 2013 and then got the opposite. So like many other people that lived through this, many people who lived in Brazil uh, over this time period, when other kinds of explosions like this, unexpected, apparently spontaneous, huge bursts of people into the streets from 2013 on to the end of the decade in 2020, I paid very close attention thinking, well, is it going to go the same way that it did in Brazil? Uh, I hope it doesn't. Sometimes it did, sometimes it did not. Sometimes there was, it was somewhere in the middle, but this was a concern of mine because this strange paradox of what had happened in Brazil in 2013 really haunted me as I think it haunts a lot of my peers and friends that were living through it. And then I also began to look backwards. I began to look at the explosions that began uh, in North Africa in 2010 and 2011 because I came to the conclusion that not only in 2013, but after, the explosion in Brazil, that it would not have gone the way it did if people in the, the press, including people in my class, the, the international correspondents tasked with covering the, the country, did not interpret June 2013 as if it were somehow like the so-called Arab Spring. So what did I do with this uh, very specific uh, uh, set of concerns? I decided to construct a history. Um, I decided on a project which was perhaps silly in its ambition. I decided to tell the story of the decade, 2010 to 2020, as if the most important thing to happen in that decade was mass protests that got so big that they fundamentally destabilized or overthrew existing governments. I think you might as well tell the story of that, of that decade as if it is the thing that um, is the most important. Um, obviously, you cannot actually tell the story of a global decade. So like every every history that's built around a set of concerns, it excludes it, it includes based on what matters to us now in the present. Um, and the big question around which I build this narrative history constructed through 200 and 250 interviews with people in 12 countries is how was it possible that so many mass protests apparently led to the opposite of what they asked for? Um, so I think that the answer, there's no answer, the answer is in, the, in the, the, the story itself, it's in the book, and I hope people come to the book with different experiences, different ideas, um, and different concerns, and come away from it with different answers, and I'm happy to start to discuss the, 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 the themes that emerge. But that's what I tried to do. I tried to build the history of that decade around this strange paradox that I lived through, and that I felt, think, matters to how we will live uh, the decades uh, in the future. So thank, thanks for your interest, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll pass it off to, to Anne. Thanks so much. Um, well, to Anthony and everybody at Haymarket, um, Vincent, I really want to thank you for the incredible contribution uh, that this book represents. Um, and I can't wait to, to dig into it with you. I think it was Ryan Grimm who pointed out in his interview with you after his interview with me for, for Deconstructed, that he noticed these parallels in our two texts um, that maybe we hadn't noticed ourselves. And so a big thanks to Ryan as well, because that I think is what 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 birthed the idea of this conversation. <clears throat> so Doppelganger is actually a little bit more difficult to to summarize um, in five minutes than 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 my previous books were, uh, simply because it is more a work of 
uh, creative nonfiction than my than my previous books were sort of traditional um, nonfiction texts that had a sort of thesis uh, up front and then you know a, a series of chapters that built on that thesis and attempted to defend it and and then summarized it at the end. Doppelganger is much more of a winding, weirder tale. It still attempts to do what I try to do with my books, which is create a political map of the moment. Um, but it's a weirder map. And the journey is kind of the point on this one. Um, so, so sorry if I fail uh, in advance to, to 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 boil it down to to just a few minutes. Um, it does use the fact that I have a real life doppelganger as a starting point, as somebody who I have been perennially confused and conflated with for oh these many uh, years, going decades. Uh, the nonfiction writer Naomi Wolf who during COVID became a very active purveyor of medical misinformation. Um, this is not the subject of the book. It is really a device that I use to get at different kinds of doubling and mirroring that I think are reshaping our world, including our social movements. So I look at the way, um, and this is a theme that I explore in my first book that Vincent <laughs> read when he was in high school, making me feel very old. Um, but the rise of, of lifestyle branding. You know, when I wrote No Logo in the 1990s, the idea um, that every corporation should be a brand um, was a relatively new idea and regular people and social movements did not openly think of themselves as brands. Celebrities maybe, but not just everyday people. So of course, social media changed this, changes this. We all have marketing firms in our back pockets in the form of our iPhones, and we now have this ability to perform a kind of commodity version of ourselves. And so do our social movements, right? So this is one of the, this is a kind of doppelganger because that, 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 brand version of us, that brand version of a social movement, um, you know, with it, with, with its protected, uh, um, slogans and hashtags is, 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 is both us and not us is both our movements and not our movements. It's a mark in, in the same way that marketing always misrepresents, um, and always is an act of repetition. So the book explores what is this doing to our relationships with one another? How is it shaping the kinds of movements that we have? Um, also look at other kinds of, of, of doppelgangers doubling, including the way AI are, uh, uh, creates this kind of mimicry machine um, where it seems like we're creating new things, um, but actually all we're able to do is sort of endlessly replicate what already exists. Um, and then it gets into the way politics increasingly feels like a mirror world, sort of society split into um, and increasingly uh, reactive, where rather than having um, uh, uh, movements that are defined by a, a legible set of principles and values that are embodied regardless of circumstances, increasingly, I think we have um, something left-ish, and I don't think it is an actual left, uh, that responds to whatever the right is doing in a very reactive way. You know, I, I write in the book that, that we, we kind of are the yin to each other's yang. Um, so if they're against something, we're for it, and this, and vice versa. And this became, I think, particularly uh, acute in the period that I look at closely in the book, which is the period where where you had the most um, kind of intrusive COVID health measures. Um, and when the right went off into conspiracy land about vaccines and 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 um, lockdowns. And, you know, my doppelganger talked about this as a plot of the Chinese Communist Party to bring a social credit system to the West. She called it a fascist coup and so on. Then the response from a lot of progressives was very kind of obedient, you know, roll up your sleeve, get your shot, as if this was the sum total of how we thought our governments should respond to the pandemic. And of course, the left has much more ambitious ideas than that. Um, so I look at the way there's been um, a, a co-optation of a lot of core issues, including critiques that I came up in of big pharma, big tech, um, corporate consolidation more generally. And these issues kind of get left unattended and then figures like Bannon or Georgia Maloney absorb them into a far right agenda. Um, and that is a big problem because these are potent issues. We know them to be potent. We've organized around them over the years. We've seen them bring um, uh, you know, millions of people into the street 
streets worldwide. And if there isn't a left agenda that is speaking to public rage at uh, you know, incredible levels of corporate consolidation and many of the movements that you track in the book, Vincent, are were such movements. If we don't, if those movements are no longer really speaking to that, then the terror, the terrain is ripe for for right wing cooptation, and we are in this moment where we are seeing uh, the far right um, surge around the world. Um, so, the final uh, uh, third of the book, uh, it you know, I call the section Shadowlands. Um, some people have referred to this as the Jewish parts of the book. Uh, and this is, I, you know, my most Jewish book, I have to confess. Um, so this mainly refers to two chapters um, that have been feeling uh, painfully relevant of late. One is called the Nazi in the mirror, and the other is called the unshakable ethnic double. And they wrestle with many themes, uh, um, many different kinds of doubling, including the persistence of anti-Semitism as an ancient conspiracy theory and kind of an ancient double that is projected onto all Jews. Philip Roth called it, you know, Shylock, called that figure Shylock after after Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice character. Um, uh, and it also looks at the dangers of a particular kind of trauma enforced uh, trauma forged identity politics as they play out in Israel. So I get into many of the ongoing debates about how the Nazis were influenced by European colonialism and racial segregation in the Americas, um, into what uh, Du Bois and M. Cesar wrote about as, as the Nazis as a kind of doppelganger um, or, and Hitler as a sort of, as a shadow um, of uh, European colonial violence and how a failure to reckon with those connections shaped and warped Israeli history and exiled Palestinians into an unbearable purgatory that today looks very much like hell on earth. Uh, in literature and film, doppelganger stories often feature characters trying to annihilate their doubles. So if you back to Dostoevsky or Edgar Allan Poe, you often have these doppelganger stories where the, where, where the protagonist uh, tries to kill their doppelgangers, tries to stab them or some such, and ends up stabbing themselves. Uh, so as a Jewish person, this is what I have long help, felt to be happening in Israel as it moves further and further to the right in attempting to banish and destroy the quote other, my people risk destroying themselves in spirit, if not in body. So I don't think we get out of any of this unless we find powerful new and robust models of solidarity that go beyond the branded self and the branded identity group. Um, and so I think it's especially important to have these kinds of spaces to think critically about what transformational movements can learn um, from the missteps and failures of the past. Um, I think it's our only hope. So Vincent, I'm going to I'm going to start with a question for you. Um, you talked about about, about this amazing assignment you gave to yourself uh, of looking at this decade of mass protests and doing a, a reportorial audit of, 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 you know, did they achieve what they hope to achieve? Um, what is their legacy? And looking really unflinchingly at places where, uh, where, where the mirroring and co-optation was so extreme that actually ground was tangibly lost. Um, so often books that are critical of left-wing movements are written from the outside, um, whether by somebody who you know had no involvement, no stakes in them, or someone who was part of them, but has since seen the light and is kind of blowing the whistle on all of their failures. Um, your book is written, I think, I think I feel like from a place of of comradeship, a place of shared goals, um, but it is unflinching in its critiques and evaluations. <clears throat> it seems to come very much from the tradition of, uh, uh, you know, what Latin America in Latin America is often called autocritica, self criticism, uh, um, as opposed to the more North American call out. Um, so. I guess I just wanted to ask you personally why you felt it was so important to look back in this particular kind of spirit um, uh, to take this particular kind of stock. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much. So I absolutely hope that in every case, 
uh, in the book, um, I start from a position of sympathy. I think it would be quite disingenuous. Uh, 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 it would be dishonest about my own position. I think it would be quite ugly if I were to start a chapter about people going to the streets and risking their lives um, for what they conceive to be a better world without starting from a position of trying to understand this huge energy that really exists to try to change the world. Um, and uh, 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 so at the same time that I try to be as um, sympathetic and yet, yet perhaps comradely as possible, I don't choose the, uh, the, the episodes based on my affinity, right? So I, I choose them based on how big they get. Um, I choose the ones that really turn out to be so apparently successful that they either dislodge or destabilize a, a, an existing government. And so um, that means that they end up all, all over the, the ideological map. Um, they don't, they're not all things that are exactly where I want to be, but I think that we have to reckon with this very obvious desire to change the global system. And everyone, you know, there are different interpretations of, of what that means. But if we look at the amount of people that protest from 2010 to 2020, I think that there is a, a clear desire to change the global system. And then also to look where this led in each individual case. Um, for, I think, several reasons. Um, one, it's just fundamental to understand where we are now. Um, I think a lot of these cases were experienced as euphoric victory by the sort of global public, and then the journalists, people like me, went away, and we sort of lost track of what happened, even though the long-term consequences of many of these explosions are fundamental uh, to where we are now. I think, you know, two of the biggest geo geopolitical, um, ongoing geopolitical crises, both in and around Gaza and Ukraine are related to the 2011 and 2014 moments in North Africa and Ukraine. So reason one is this is, is I think it's under, this is a uh, an important way to get to 2020 and understand the nature um, of the global system as we as we embark on this new decade to um, the willingness, the desire to be, the decision to be unflinching and to ask really what happened is something that I found my interviewees were very excited about. It was the people that sat down with me over four years of very difficult conversations that often said that they would not be doing it if I were just going to try to figure out what happened and what was the source of these horrible uh, experiences. They their desire to participate in the in the project was a result of their belief that there was something to be learned from what we had been through. Um, so the 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 book would not have been possible or um, imbued with the same spirit. I think if if the people that spoke to me did not believe in getting together across ten, thirteen, however you want to count it, countries, um, and trying to learn from the tactical decisions that were made, because you know. Ingredient one is there. There's a huge amount of desire to change the global system. I think that's clear. Um, but they wanted to learn from it. And then finally, I think that in the long, long, long term, these aren't necessarily failures. Yeah, I mean, so some of the some of the cases in the in the book lead to short term victories or, or, or some modified victories. Um, but in the long, long, long term, I mean, many people would like to see a world in which they look back upon some of these uprisings as the beginning of a bigger victory. But again, that only happens if um, they believe. Many interviewees told me. Um, something is learned from what happens and, and this tactical adjustment uh, takes place. So again, so I'll, I'll ask you also a question about choice. Um, I looked at apparent losses or apparent you know, setbacks. Um, you look at a lot of people that are written off as lost by many people in the mainstream or, 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 or left of center establishment in the United States. You look at, so the question is why look at what some people would call conspiracists or nut jobs, people that have, you know, gone off the deep end, why try to understand what what drives this rather than, you know, I'm playing it at devil's eye, perhaps it's obvious, rather than just saying, okay, 20% of North America's lost their minds, whatever that was, that country, with, you know, United States and Canada were insane in the first place, we got to figure out something else, uh, some, some other revolutionary subject, which is important. Why try to understand what was fueling this rather than just insisting that they go away or in an extreme case, just asking our tech overlords to deplatform them forever and pretend like they don't exist. Yeah, um, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think you might be lowballing it on the twenty percent. 
especially in the U.S. Uh, you know, I, I, I would have to, I would get these questions a bit on book tour, particularly in the U.K. in a sort of a very snotty aristocratic accent of like, well, why give them attention as if we continue to be we, you know, you know uh, liberals on in sort of legacy media are continuing to be the gatekeepers of attention um, as if there are not is, the, uh, you know, platforms that are in many cases many times larger that are being developed by figures like, uh, you know, uh, maybe Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, um, you know, then then what's what's even offered by, you know, legacy media like CNN. Um, so my doppelganger Wolf was deplatformed uh, and 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 her deplatforming was much cheered by by liberal Twitter. Uh, she's since back on uh, under Musk. But but uh, because I had decided to try to understand her and pay attention to her, and also because I didn't have a choice, because when she would go on Fox News with Tucker Carlson, um, you know, I would hear about it because people would think it was me and they would get very angry at me. So I was aware that after she had seemingly been deleted from from, you know, polite liberal society, she was getting access to 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 platforms much larger than she had before precisely because she was one of these ex-liberals willing to um to say that 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 the left had descended into fascism under joe biden um and so i started to listen to her on fox and in particular on steve bannon's daily show which has a huge following where she would sometimes be on every single day and you know, so on a basic level, I pay attention because, you know, this is a, you know, when it comes to somebody like Bannon, I, I mean, I think he has a track record of showing that he can change our world. Like we can ignore him, but that doesn't mean that he's not going to continue to be a strategist for people like Donald Trump. And, you know, we will, we, we will, we will have to live in the world that they create. And, and Bannon is a very internationalist figure, right? Uh, you know, when he was ousted from Trump's White House, because I think Trump felt he was being upstaged. He went off and wove together a network of far right parties that includes uh, Bolsonaro, that includes uh, Georgia Maloney and and Viktor Orban, and and you know he he um, I think Varoufakis calls it the nationalist international. Um, uh, they take internationalism very seriously. They trade strategies. They look at what works in one national context and apply it in another. You know, transphobia gets tons of traction in Bra Brazil. It pops up in Italy, right? Um, and you know, that's partly because of the sort of network that Bannon is creating. I was really struck when I would listen to him every day. <clears throat> that he had more international coverage than a lot of liberal media, that he was covering what was, you know, what was happening. And in, in, I didn't trust his coverage, but he was, it, it was not nearly as kind of parochial and insular as a lot of North American liberal media is. Um, so I guess we have to pay attention to it because they're powerful. Um, I, us not giving them attention does not mean that they go away. Like we can't just like close our eyes and ignore them and imagine that we still, you know, like control the spigot of attention. Um, and also I think as, as um, you know, a lifelong leftist, I was really struck by the ways that Bannon in particular was taking issues that I, that are familiar to me as a leftist and, and absorbing them into this very nefarious, far right, xenophobic, transphobic, uh, um, you know, neo-fascist agenda. So, like sometimes, sometimes he he, I, you know, people may have heard me talk about this before, but you know, I think the moment where my blood ran truly cold was when I was listening to his show, and he played this audio montage of um, like MSNBC and CNN during the pandemic. And and it was just different different ho different hosts and and intros and out outros to to big shows going brought to you by Pfizer brought to you by Moderna, um, and 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 he said something to the effect of you know it's by the rich for the rich and against you, um, and there was something about that that was so familiar from the teachings of the ultra globalization movement, and I was just struck by the fact that you know post Bernie there really didn't seem to be that much discussion of the oligarch class, of the billionaires, of corporate consolidation. And 
he is just a master of absorbing the issues that we leave unattended. He did it with free trade in 2016. And I was just watching him do it with big pharma, with, with big ag, with big tech. And, you know, I think, I think we really should pay attention when our, when, like it's it, like, we can't stop the right from co-opting parts of our agenda, but what we can do is we can make them less available for co-optation by speaking to them ourselves. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> no, fantastic. And that is yeah. um, very convincing in the book. So I really enjoyed not only the points of unexpected overlap with my concerns, even though I'm coming at everything, but, but that part is, is quite convincing. The, the, the ways in which when we, you know, mainstream media, center left, um, you know, those of us that consider ourselves, you know, acceptable thought, leave, leave an issue entirely ignored. <laughs> Uh, they're not, it's not going to be ignored. Someone else is going to go, go out and grab it. Um, so let, let me ask you another question, but I think that is, I think, related to your work and also mine, yours, uh, of course, coming first uh, in, this, in, this, in this case and influencing mine. I want to ask about the relationship of these topics to the history of violence, empire, uh, and repression that I think we both see as some of their preconditions. Um, it seems that doppelganger is, is about an, abil an ability for a lot of people to correctly identify and effectively challenge neoliberal structures, but also that this inability itself is precisely or can be linked to neoliberal subjectivity, the types of person that is intentionally individualized, always concentrating on themselves, viewing, viewing the self as a business or a personal brand and suspicious of any collective action, right? So it seems that there's not only this big structure, but there's the type of individual that it's formed that runs over here to these easy answers uh, or just turns back on itself rather than than um, um, uh, looking over here at the big at the structure that that is really oppressing them. Um, and so, as we both, you know, your book, um, the Shock Doctrine, very famously uh, explores, um, neoliberalism didn't just pop out of nowhere; it did not appear naturally on planet Earth. Uh, people with guns had to had to enforce its arrival. Severe and widespread violence was required for its implementation. So, you know. Uh, it's a long way of asking a very simple question. What's the relationship between the shock doctrine mm -hmm. and doppelgangers? Do you think there's a relationship between that violent repression and the particular types of responses that we now reach for to this very um, exploitative system, um, even though they tend not to be very effective? Yeah. Um, you know, in lots of ways, I think, I think, this is a, a, a sequel to to the shock doctrine. I mean, it also draws on some of the material in No Logo around personal branding. But but it, it it's a book really about a state of shock, right? Because and a state of shock is um, it is not just something big and bad happening. It, it's something big and bad happening that we don't understand. We go into shock when we don't really have a way of processing an event that we experience, um, and so. It, it, you know, as a reporter, I have covered a lot of different uh, um, uh, uh, disasters, moments in history where societies have gone into that state and there has been a deliberate attempt to exploit that in order to push a, you know, pro-corporate agenda. Um, so shock doctrine begins and ends with Hurricane Katrina as an example of that and looking at how that, that shock was used to, to privatize the school system and get rid of public housing and so on. Um, but as you say, also looks at the way neoliberalism was introduced with blood and fire um, and, and very deliberate strategies of, exploit, of creating and exploiting states of emergencies uh, in the aftermath of, of military coups. Um, so I think, you know, it's it's related in the sense that part of the reason why conspiracy theories are surging is that they are stories. They are stories that enter into a vacuum of meaning. And COVID was a, you know, COVID-19 was a novel virus. Um, I think be technology enabled a kind of, of shutdown for people who were privileged enough to be shut down and be served by working class people who bore all the risks that, you know, that wasn't possible during previous pandemics. I mean, pre-Zoom, pre-remote teaching, pre you know, like all these, these technologies allowed a kind of a isolation that was not 
and I was not an option. It, it, there have been pandemics before, but 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 not with these technologies that enabled that that kind of possible response. Um, so I think that that's part of the reason why why conspiracy culture surged in the way that it did. Um, but in answer to your question around the relationship between violence and the particular kinds of subjectivities or failure to respond, I mean, this is something that really preoccupies me. Um, you know, I think that we agree that that the 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 left globally experienced a kind of uh, a politicide um, through 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 terror, and 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 the global south experienced it m more violently than the global north. But there were global north variations of this that were overwhelmingly borne by um, by black and brown people in the global north. Um, so in, in the shock doctrine, I quote the great um, investigative journalist in Argentina, Rodolfo Walsh, who was, he was gunned down in the streets of Buenos Aires um, right after he had written this very famous open letter to the military junta where he, um, where he, where he outlined many, many of their physical and economic crimes, like the, the disappearances, the tortures, um, but also the shock therapy that they enabled. And as I was writing the shock doctor, I was very haunted by this line in the open letter where he, where he predicted that it would take 20 to 30 years for the left to recover from the terror that they experienced. Um, because, you know, what p politicide is trying to do is not just affect the people being tortured or the people being disappeared. It's a form of mass communication. And it is a warning. It's saying, if you step out of line, you will be next. And so, um, it, you know, Rodolfo, he was right in that it, almost exactly 25 years after he wrote that, Argentina uh, came into the streets in 2001 in one of these kind of mass uprisings that you catalog in the book. I mean, you don't catalog that one because it's not in your decade, but it is, you know, they, they overthrew five presidents in a week. It was one of those everyone uh, moments. And it was, it was rejectionist in the sense that, you know, the slogan was Casey by and todos. It was, you know, the, it basically threw out all the bums. It was very ideological. It's very, you know, I thought about it a lot in reading your book because it was a, a, like a, a lot of it was informed by hor horizontalism, John Holloway. So it was another one of those examples where, okay, okay, just to back up, I think reading your book, what what I, what what is clear to me is that there is a the thawing or the resurgence, right? That what that that Walsh was writing about. It doesn't happen all at once. It's almost like the body is able to fight first, right? So in in, in Argentina in, in 2001, people would say the dictatorship just ended, and and, mm -hmm. and and I was like, I was confused, you know, because I was like, well, I thought it ended 12 years ago, um, but that what they were saying was they're ready to fight again, you know, um, and and that spirit of revolution is back, but the I think the effect of of, of that terror on the mind, on the imagination, it takes longer to recover, right? So people are willing to say no, but the ability to say yes, to actually put forward a vision of a socialist future, of an eco-socialist future, of an eco-socialist feminist future, like really say, what do we want instead of this? And as you say in the book, you know, to have a plan of how to get to A and B, that, that took longer to shake off. Um, so, yeah, I want to ask this same question of you, which, you know, that, that, that you, in the Jakarta method, um, you, you dug very deeply into this wave of, of anti-left terror. Um, and, and if we burn, you are tracking the, the, the social movements that emerged after that terror, but how do you think the terror shaped the, the other thing, you know, this theme that runs through the books uh, uh, of of wanting to confront power but not take power, not mm -hmm. you know say no but not say yes, uh, or 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 be a bit cagey about what the uh, the yes is. Is that really ideological, or is that a hangover of terror? No, that's a great question, and I think that like most things like this, it's both, and it overlaps to different degrees in different countries. 
um, um, over the decade. Um, but I really like that. I really like the idea of, of like a body politic or, or, or uh, 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 a national political culture of resistance getting back certain, you know, certain muscles come back first, or there's the thing that's easy to do now, but it's not easy to do this later. And it, it takes a, quite a while because you do see this, I think. You can trace this also in the book. You can look at the ways in which they are, some countries are further along at, at recovering from decimation uh, and others uh, are, are, are more really responding or forced to respond in a certain way by concrete decimation. So just to answer that question, uh, that you made me think a lot of different things at once, but to answer that question, I'll try to explain like the, the core package around which I build the book, because the book is really about a, in a recipe of tactics, a very particular form of response to injustice that becomes hegemonic in the 2010s, often sometimes seeing as the natural or only way uh, to respond to injustice. And that is the apparently spontaneous leaderless, digitally coordinated, horizontally structured mass protest in public squares or in public uh, spaces. And what I try to demonstrate is that each of those things comes from somewhere. Uh, like, like anything else that humans do, it's not written on our, uh, 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 on our hearts uh, by God. We've learned it through processes of, of ideological um, and material evolution. Um, um, and what happens in this decade is that this particular package becomes incredibly powerful, and often much more so than expected. Now, the relationship to the first book, I think does shape the, the ways in which this becomes the easiest thing to do, or perhaps the only possible to thing to do in certain national circumstances. So Argentina 2001 does matter quite a lot in the book. I only spent a couple of paragraphs on it, but I spoke to a lot of people to live through it. Um, and this is, you know, the experience of Argentina 2001 really informs the Brazilian movement um, that organizes the protest in 2013. They're watching um, uh, documentaries about this movement. They're, they're, un they're understanding what happened. And they really believe in horizontal ism as a guiding philosophy. They live in a democracy in which perhaps it was possible actually to enter into negotiations with the government or to elaborate a set of, uh, of demands to uh, the Workers' Party. At least this is what the Workers' Party would say now. This is what they told me. Um, in other cases, that horizontality, the apparent spontaneity, the apparent uh, leaderlessness, the, 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 the ways in which uh, it really seemed to be a lot of individuals coming together very quickly that didn't know each other was not was less ideologically driven. It was the consequence, I'm thinking now of Egypt in 2011. Uh, it was the consequence of the concrete decimation of the structures that would have done things perhaps slightly differently. It was the consequence of decades of de decimation of the organized left, civil society groups and working class uh, organizations that would have been perhaps in a position to do things differently. So many Egyptians would have loved to have some kind of a vanguard party or some kind of a revolutionary agent or some kind of big uh, 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 um, and well-structured labor movement. They just did it. It had all been crushed. And so what came together very quickly and which was made a little bit easier by social media was this big mass protest. And so across the decade, I think we see the, the combination of those two elements, the material and the ideolog ideological. You see in some cases, this is what is left, this is what is available um, strikes, which often help to put real pressure on um, um, existing governments in these moments of, of contestation, proved impossible if the labor movement had been all killed or, or, or destroyed. Um, some kind of a left-wing party that maybe would have been able to say, you know, we are going, you know, we, we would like to take power in, in uh, after uh, uh, um, uh, this chaos. In the case of many countries in the global southeast, people have been actually wiped out. My first book, Jakarta Method, is about the employment of mass murder against the left or people accused of being the left in 22 countries. So to explain the where this package comes from, this very specific recipe, I think you have to have both. You have to look at terror unleashed against the organized left, against the organized working class and against other civil society organizations that happened starting in the Cold War and through the neoliberal era, um, but also the ideological factors, the elements that were, I think, um, for understandable reasons, were quite popular um, at the beginning of the 20th century and then into the 2010s, thinking that perhaps the internet changed the rules, that perhaps we could skip all of the tough, mm. uh, the tough uh, movement building that had often been historically necessary. Um, 
And that, you know, even that ideological moment, even that ideological component can be linked perhaps to McCarthyism, to the to a generation that experienced either any association with the traditional left as dangerous, um, politically dangerous in the United States or tainted by um, what they saw as the failures of the Soviet Union. So um, that's a long way of saying yeah. uh, I think it's both. Um, I think it's both. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um yeah, thanks for that. I will. So I want to. I want to get into the. You know, I think the scariest part of this, which is what what fills the vacuum um, created when there isn't a political program. Understanding that, you know, I think in some cases, ideology. Um, there, there is a there's a clear ideological commitment to not putting forward a political program. You know, in Argentina, like the the our dreams don't fit on your ballot. I'm a, a, a sort of, um, and there were fights about this. I mean, I remember it at the time of of you know wh- wh- whether to put something for put put something forward in a pol- in an electoral context because there were elections happening, or whether just to leave that space to the Peronists, and and that ended up happening, and they you know, we're lucky in a way that some of the movements were, were that you, that you, that, that you track in the book were not in that, you know, th- there could have been a right wing resurgence in that moment. It was very close. It didn't happen. Now it has. Right. Um, but then, you know, the, the Egypt example is, is a, an interesting one. And, you know, I think about Ali Abed al-Fattah's writing and his incredible book, um, uh, You Have Not Yet Been Defeated, where he goes over and over and he's still in prison. And, and, and you know, he has spent much of his time in prison thinking about what went wrong and doing that kind of autocritica um, and, and, and talks about how right, that right before the elections, they had they had been begun this process that was modeled on the South African Freedom Charter to try to collectively write a constitution. But democracy does take time, right? I mean, if you're going to, that wasn't a radical commitment to like not having a political program for power. It was just a commitment to developing it in a democratic way. But the trouble is if you don't have a, that kind of democratic commitment, you're going to be ready and waiting with the plan, right? And if, um, you know, I guess one of the um, advantages to having a, a religious movement is that, you know, you said you said it isn't written uh, on our hearts by God, but what if you think it was? Right. And then you and then you actually already have the book in which God wrote those words, and all your job is to is just to translate in, that into law. Um, so. Yeah, I was hoping that you could talk about what you have seen in terms of, you know, the left opening the space mm-hmm. and more regressive movements filling the vacuum. Um, and, you know, we talked a bit about Egypt. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how, how what that looked like in Brazil, um, Hong Kong. Um, yeah, what, whatever springs to mind, because I think this is so important in this moment, understanding that this is not about, it's not about blame. It's not about, oh, you guys screwed up. It's like, this is, you decimate the left. Uh, you don't have the structures that are capable of engaging in a democratic process. Um, you do have some forces that have stayed organized, met, um, and they move into that space. So, Give us some examples, and then maybe we can talk about what to do. <laughs> yeah, and I mean that's an, a fantastic question because I think this is really the striking place which the books overlap is this mm-hmm. the importance of vacuums and the quick the quick the the, the speed at which they will be filled um, because as a way of answering that initial question, how is it possible that uh, so many movements um, led to the opposite of what they asked for? It wasn't. It isn't that they screwed up. What often happened is unexpected success. This recipe that was often put together, not really with the intention of actually overthrowing the government. This, this, you know, they wanted a lot of people to come to the streets, but it was often not planned that that many people would come to the streets. So it is often this initial, unexpected, wild success that creates an opportunity, that creates a power vacuum. And then tragically, many of these movements are horrified, or the original organizer at least are horrified to find that they've created a power vacuum Either there's a government which has been overthrown or there's a government which is badly weakened and would like to give something up, would like to give some power uh, over to the streets. 
Um, and they found, um, in many cases, this is a very broad rubric for understanding the, the outcomes, that a protest, uh, specifically, especially a protest of this kind, apparently spontaneous, leaderless, occasionally coordinated, brought together very, very quickly, is very poorly constituted to take advantage of a power vacuum. A protest cannot form a revolutionary government. Protest often even failed at elaborating to a weakened and scared ruling class what they would what they would um, accept in exchange for leaving the streets. And so as a way of understanding what happens, you just have to see who ran into that vacuum. Um, in some really tragic cases, um, and this is another way that the, I think the both of our books end up being accidental or indirect prequels is that a lot of very after this moment of um, apparent victory there is this horrible realization that oh despite the internet despite the end of the cold war we still live in an imperial global system mm -hmm. like there may be a foreign power that is coming in over the bridge to crush us saudi arabia might march it march its military over the over into bahrain and to crush this uh, uh, uprising and the power vacuum is filled by the biggest, meanest guy in the neighborhood. Um, or it might be NATO using legitimate complaints about the government of Gaddafi to, to launch a, uh, a, a regime change operation. Uh, it may be domestic actors, those that are most organized, whether they're on the right or they're on the left, but they're the, those that have often formed collective bonds, come up with some kind of an idea of what they would like to do, and they're willing to move in quickly. Um, so that is a general uh, 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 overview of how this works. Brazil goes slower because Brazil's in a strange situation. It's very strange because Brazil has a democratically elected president. She's very popular at the beginning of June 2013. But it becomes clear to everyone that there is a, as I said, a ball of energy on the streets and no one knows what to do with it. The government doesn't know what to do with it. The original organizer don't, don't know what to do with it. And so a group of well-financed, cynical and savvy libertarian right right leaning uh, no right wing us funded kids recognize i think correctly that the meaning of the streets is up for grabs so what they do and this is a very very doppelganger moment this is a very mirror world moment they form a group whose name is an intentional copy that is meant to be sound the same as the group that is initially uh, organized the protest in June 2013. The original group is MPL. They came up with a group called MBL. And MBL pretends to be all the things that the original group uh, actually was, which is fully committed to autonomy from the state, fully leaderless, grassroots, digitally coordinate, coordinated uh, uh, um, movement that was not directed by anyone. But really, they are. They're getting money from the United States. One of these kids is trained under the Koch brothers, and they know exactly what they want. They, they want to move the state in a more neoliberal direction. They want to privatize everything. And they ultimately, I think, win to the point where, tragically, I go back to Brazil in 2021 to do interviews mm -hmm. for this book. And I tell a bunch of people, oh, I'm back. You know, I'm interviewing Haddad, who is the, the mayor of Sao Paulo at the time, now the foreign minister. I'm interviewing um, uh, members of the MPL. And Brazilians thought I said MBL because the MPL is a player now. They've replaced the MPL as an actor on, on the stage. So they recognize, I think, correctly, cynically though, that there was something was up for grabs and they had the funding and the, in the, in the cynicism um, to, to take advantage of it. In other cases, as I, as I said, mm -hmm. it may just be pre-existing political elites or the biggest, baddest guy in the neighborhood that says, oh, the government's destabilized. I'm gonna go and do that thing that I've wanted to do for a long time. I mean. And then I want to, yeah, again, take this back, turn this back to you, because vacuums, I think, are really central. Mm. They run through your book, even when you're not explicitly talking about them. Um, the, the ways in which a vacuum of narratives, or I think the, uh, yeah, the, the, the term that really struck me in the introduction was the ways that narrative vacuums are always filled. That when we as human beings don't know what's happening, we don't know how to, especially in moments of trauma or, or moments of like a pandemic, where really... It's quite difficult to establish what's happening. There is a hunger for someone to d supply some kind of a narrative. Um, but this one, you know, both of our books are about, I think, very difficult questions. Uh, but I think this seems this one seems really difficult to me uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, the first is that our societies and, and the global system is now so complex, far more complex than in, in the 20th century, far more complex certainly than when, you know, the classical political economists were operating. It, it, it's, it, this complexity makes it that 
intuitive knowledge or self-directed study, you know, doing your own research mm-hmm. are really often going to lead you down the, path, around the, the, the wrong path. It's going to be really difficult for people to comprehend the real reality, the, the true reality based on facts of the world. Uh, if they're if they're if they're being directed in the way that we have always been directed, I think as as contemporary subjects, as individuals, to you know, figure it out for yourself and do what's right, what's right for you. And then there's the other very big problem that the business model for journalism, traditional journalism, the type that was always very very imperfect, and I think always served to some extent the interests of the ruling class, especially in the, in, in powerful first world countries, and, and often uh, would apologize for uh, foreign policy disasters. But even that, even that very imperfect thing just seems to be going away. <laughs> and mm-hmm. the internet as it was as it was conceived or made possible initially to us has been enclosed. I like this, you said that it's, you know, this is an enclosement carried out um, by tech uh, oligarchs. So, I mean, <laughs> this is a difficult question, but I mean, how, do we deal with the problem of the ease of the simple and correct narrative entering a narrative vacuum in the face of an incredibly complex system and no mechanisms for passing down centuries of human knowledge? I mean, is there any way to sort of, is there any way to claw back or avoid total epistemic collapse without somehow being authoritarian or insisting we're the ones with the real knowledge, we'll, we'll give it to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and, or, and, you know, put it another way, do the existing tools of communication we have? Do we need to take them back? Do we need to nationalize Twitter? Do we need to do we need to do something? How do, is there any way to to escape this very uh, difficult situation that I took a long time describing? <laughs> yeah, well, I was def- definitely thinking while you were talking that that maybe job one is fighting for the internet is fighting for what the internet. Um, could have been, but wasn't. And this is, you know, something else in your book that 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 I think is incredibly important is that th- this form of of digital communications is not the only one on offer. We both remember a time when, you know, th- that sort of euphoria, that promise of the uh, of what the internet could represent was not just, you know, people declaring Facebook revolutions and Twitter uprisings. It was the, um, you know, the early email lists that knitted together uh, the Zapatista uprising with the global alter globalization movement and those indie media, that the global indie media networks um, that, you know, though imperfect, were not commercialized and, um, and and you know I remember when I you know got in got it got an email from you know an early hacker involved in some of those um, you know the, the sort of early movement internet um, experiments saying there's this cool platform called Twitter you really should try it you know like it's we really think it has big potential I'm really mad at him if he's listening <laughs> because. You know, we, we we need to contest for this. You know, I, I quote Ben Tarnoff's book, Internet for the People, you know, about how we can still uh, uh, fight to treat the Internet like a commons, like a public utility. I don't know if that means nationalizing Twitter, though I continue to be in favor of that or at least turning it into a u- user's co-op or some other Twitter rival. I mean, I, mean, I think people are are trying to do that, but it is it is difficult um, when you have these platforms that are so large and so many people are invested in them that when you develop an alternative that may be governed by better values, it doesn't provide what that other space was providing, which is exactly what Elon Musk said it provided when he bought it, which was a digital town square, which you know is pointing to, uh, to, to the problem. Why should one man own the digital town, the, the global digital town square? Um, So, yeah, you know, and this, you know, in Doppelganger, I think this was a moment when I really realized something, something that, 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 you know, theme that runs through the book, which is that the right gets the facts wrong, the the conspiratorial right often gets the facts wrong, but the feelings right. So Wolf, you know, I mentioned sort of quickly that, that one of her big claims during COVID was that vaccine verification apps, you know, that we all downloaded onto our phones were actually a covert plot to bring uh, CCP social credit to the United States and have us all under mass surveillance 
and that these vaccine apps would be able to tell the government everywhere that we are. And not only that, they would be able to listen in on our conversations with people at restaurants, even in our own homes. And there was this very kind of snide response from a lot of liberals, which was this um, wait till they hear about cell phones, right? Um, which, you know, the first time I saw that line, I laughed and thought, oh yeah, th these people, like, they're so silly. They think these vaccine verification apps are doing all these, but it's actually our cell phones. And that begs the question of whether or not we're okay with the fact that our cell phones are hoovering up our data, selling them to third parties, um, that we are, you know, that they're able to make kind of doppel data doppelgangers of us um, and predict and nudge our behaviors and all of that um, and shape our movements, right? Because if our movements are playing out on these platforms, then, you know, I saw a question that from, from uh, uh, somebody about, you know, what was, uh, well, let me see if I can find this question, but um, there are, by the way, there's lots of really good questions coming in. Um, you know, about whether there was, you know, a moment, a particular moment and, um, when all of this went really wrong. And I, I think that is, that depends on where we're talking about. Um, but I think there is something around the ability of the right to co-opt the critique of big tech, you know, and when we started to hear this from not just figures like Bannon, um, but the whole sort of Peter Thiel funded wing of the Republican Party, um, that they were the ones who were saying, you know, why should these tech companies be allowed to decide speech for us and so on. And mainly what they're doing is grifting and saying, come on over to our tech platforms where we'll decide. But the idea of ceding that territory I think was so incredibly dangerous. So, um, yeah, so I think, I hope that answers it a little bit. I can mean, I, one of the things yeah. that I think is, yeah, I, I do want you to, yeah. Can I ask a really quick follow-up? Because I yeah. detect a problem here, and I think, I mean, not a problem, but it's, it's something we would have to face. Because I really, I, I love this idea, I agree, of taking back the internet. But then the idea of treating it like a public utility or treating it like the commons, treating it like, let's say we treat it like a public utility. We treat it like... Uh, the public school system in the United States, we treat it like the post office. This means using the state, right? This means using, would it need, would we, would it be required to use a government, you know, the entity that has police, that has mm -hmm. a military to carry this out? And would that not be quite, would that not, um, how would, would we, would, a, would an answer be required to the people like Naomi Wolf that say, well, this is okay, it's happening, really, it's happening, the government is taking away. Mm. the media from us, whereas really it actually doesn't belong to us, it belongs to, to Elon Musk. Sure. But yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think that, um, I think, I think, you know, Tarnoff makes the argument that, that it really needs to begin, you know, at a, at a sort of neighborhood by neighborhood level with remunicipalizations. Uh, you know, we have some examples of that around access to, in, like, in, treating it, the internet as a utility in Barcelona, you know, the, the right uh, the right to access. Um, but that doesn't solve the larger scale problem, right? Um, and I, But I do think that that's, you know, I think this is a critique we can get around just because we have a model which is kind of public broadcasting at its right. best in its heyday, which is not the government. I mean, it is possible to create an arm's length uh, um, you know, media kind of public utility that yes, is funded um, by the government, but no, is not controlled by the government right. uh, and is expressly not controlled by them. Right. I mean, this is, I think there are regulatory ways of responding to the concern. No, it does not need to be uh, um, state. There's a difference between state controlled media and public media. The problem right. is all every, every public media that you could point to, it has been starved by the, um, you know, the logic of austerity. I'm in Canada right now, huge cuts to the CBC, and it's really a shell of its former self. So when we look at these public broadcasters, you know, they, they don't inspire in the way that they might have, you know, 20 years ago in terms of what would be possible, right. about, you know, be, be precisely because of the success of the neoliberal project that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I was thinking about reading your book, and maybe we should go to the questions, just I mean, it has to, and this relates to something I'm seeing in the questions around, um, 
some of the political responses to to this, right? Because if we think about some a moment like Occupy Wall Street, I mean, I know you deliberately didn't spe- didn't didn't focus on North American uh, um, uprisings, and I've heard you speak about the, about why. Um, but but we've also seen attempts to learn from the vacuums that we've talked about, right? I mean, and I think we could see the Corbyn campaign, the Sanders campaign, Podemos, Syriza, as as in a you know partially pe- people who came out of the movements of the squares um, realized some of their limitations and said, okay, we're gonna th- we're, we're we're also gonna throw in with electoral politics. So um, I would love to hear you speak on that a little bit. Well, yeah. So I I um, I the what part of the reason that I, I I didn't spend time on things like that Occupy 2011 or uh, George Floyd 2020 is because I hope that people like you that actually have experience with them would come to the book with their own, uh, the people that lived through them would come with their own idea of what happened there um, and um, read it with that in mind um, because I, I wasn't there and I think that I thought that would happen naturally. So um, I'm, 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 I'm happy to have that happening um, spontaneously uh, to use a word comes up often in the book. Um, you know, I think that's right. I basically think that the this kind of, I like this thing that, uh, this um, image that I only started thinking about when you brought it up an hour ago of like a body slowly re- re- regaining diff- its, its muscles. Like the energy unleashed, not only in North Africa, but in North America in 2011, got as far as it could go, I think, in this particular form, but then people started to build power in other ways. And I think the, in North America, I think you point to, you point to this very, very quickly in the book, I think, um, the rebuilding slowly of a labor movement after it had been totally decimated uh, in the United States, Mm -hmm. Amazon, Starbucks, I think you cite, Um, but now of course UAW um, doing things that I think a lot of people would have not uh, considered possible five, 10 years ago. That's the beginning of various muscles, you know, being retrained and coming together, and yeah, absolutely learning from uh, learning from what happened, the uprisings that began in 2011, and led, you know, I think to a a big consciousness shift, and then to and part of that consciousness shift um, was the recognition that new practices, new experiments needed to happen tactically, mm-hmm. um, which is absolutely happening. It's absolutely happening. But at the same time, on the other hand, <laughs> the kind of explosions I read about did keep happening, um, but it, they didn't happen in a vacuum and they didn't happen on their own. There were, there were new attempts to build different things in, in response and thing. And I totally agree. Um, I wonder if. Now I, I do, I do just want to sort of shout out some of the attempts to, and there, there's a question. One of the themes that comes out of both of your books is the way that media and more savvy political organizations will speak for our movements if we don't speak for ourselves, but how do we do that effectively in an age of media consolidation and fractured left? Um, you know, it's it like I find myself thinking about about exceptions to these claims that we're making, like, you know, TikTokers giving incredibly lucid seminars on settler colonialism in Palestine um, and and doing this popular education on these corporate platforms um, that were not designed for that, um, but yet are going viral and are educating people. Um, you know, I think Haymarket has done an incredible service with these seminars. I think Navarra Media, you know, is 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 an example of of, of, of not just leaving it to social media, hammer and hope, you know, coming out of the racial justice reckonings and identifying the need for a place for longer form writing, not just fighting it out via hashtags. So, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, movements evolve, movements learn from their mistakes, and there are lots of examples of that happening. And, you know, I'm sure people are thinking of other examples that I haven't mentioned. So uh, just in the spirit of, of um, you know, not just sort of finger wagging here, like it, it, people are experimenting and trying to do this work, but over to you, Vincent, you were going to, I think, no, no, I think, question. no, no, yeah, I think that is, Absolutely, absolutely right. I think that this is one of the questions we can answer indir- indirectly uh, and then perhaps move on to another. But I think that, yeah, it became clear perhaps in the 2010s. It was, you know, there have been experiments going on throughout all the 20th century, but it became clear that really mediation, the representation of movements is really a site of struggle also in building alternative uh, media is a way to to participate more um, more actively in every set of, you know, in every, in every link in the chain, not just 
causing the eruption, but fighting over what it meant, fighting over what's actually happening. Um, so yeah, one of the, the final question that I was just passed is something that we were probably was inevitable we were going to speak about anyways, and it comes up at the end of your book. Um, so one of the questions, uh, how do we combat uh, the claim that opposing the Israeli government is always in itself anti-Semitic? It, it, it's what, what, what can be said about that in this moment of mass protest? Um, you know, as you trace in your book, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to understand where a certain Israeli mindset came from. Um, but what do you, as someone who knows a bit more about uh, uh, um, that ideological history, what would you say to that, to that question? Um, yeah, so, you know, I think there are just huge cracks in Israel's propaganda machine right now. And um, the heroic uh, um, uh, journalism being done by Palestinians on the ground at just risks like I've never seen before. I'm sure, Vincent, that you are blown away by the um, just the commitment and just you know, every morning checking and seeing whether folks are still alive is just probably the worst um, ritual I have ever experienced but uh, of my life. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 this is something that they're not able to control. So we are up against various distraction machines, including this perennial smear that anybody who criticizes Israel is anti-Semitic. I think it's working much less well than it used to as somebody who, who has been critical um, of, uh, of, uh, of Israel for my entire adult life. Um, and you know, have been accused of being a, a, a self-hating Jew and a capo and all the things that they like to say to us. Um, I think that 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 people are are witnessing genocidal violence with their own eyes day after day, um, and and this idea of well we're just going to show you more examples of terrible things uh, that Hamas did on October the seventh and that is somehow supposed to justify this it, it just people don't believe that I mean they're smarter than that they understand that you can. Um, uh, oppose the targeting of civilians by Hamas, and you can oppose genocidal violence by the Israeli state. Um, so I would just say, just don't get distracted by the distraction machine. Um, it is impossible to have an honest, an honest accounting and investigation of what happened on October the 7th until Israel stops the bombing, um, until Israel agrees to at minimum uh, uh, a lasting ceasefire. And so the idea of blaming us because we're not focused on October the 7th when you have hundreds of new people being killed every single day is not our problem. It is the it is what they created. Um, and they are trying to smear us uh, to distract from their violence. And the more violence, uh, the more war crimes they commit, the more frantic that distraction um, and 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 sort of claims of self victimization become. Uh, we just have to stay focused, not get intimidated. It, you know, it isn't just the smears; it's also that people are getting fired, people are getting um, you know arrested for putting up anti war posters. Um, and all of this, once again, is designed as mass communication. You know, Vincent and I talked earlier about how terror is a way of sending a message. Um, and we are getting a message right now with these are very high profile event cancellations, um, uh, um, you know, high profile people losing their jobs at magazines, at, at museums, at universities. All of that is designed to send a message that we, everybody else should shut up. Uh, you know, if they're willing to go after a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, they're willing to go after you. But the thing is that they cannot silence as many people as are speaking right now. Um, and so, th like, this is just, in my view, one of those courage moments, like, stick with it. It's working. That's why you're hit getting so much propaganda thrown at you. Um, you know, let yourself get intimidated. Let the ranks of people speaking out dwindle and we lose. Um, strength in numbers, like, like, just, just like, you know, uh, uh, whatever we, whatever we who are not in the blast zone are afraid of is nothing 
compared to what people are risking um, right now in order to give us the evidence that this is happening at all, let alone what people, um, you know, just are facing by being Palestinian in Gaza and the West Bank right now. So uh, don't worry about the smears. Uh, also, uh, don't put up with anti-Semitism, real anti-Semitism in any form. Um, respond to it right away. Um, re uh, um, and, you know, not performatively, but really understand um, that this that that this is the oldest conspiracy, uh, my most persistent conspiracy theory, um, and it has been used to destroy movements in the past to pit us against each other. And if we want to build the kind of broad uh, international movements that can stand up to international capital, you know, we um, we can't allow ourselves to be divided. And this is one of the tools of division. Um, we have to we have to we have to resist it. I think that's yeah, that's that's I think that's a fantastic answer. And uh, if it's okay with you, I have, I have an, I found another question that I think is tough, but in a good way. Uh, since we've both talked about Argentina, I think we both yeah. kind of uh, liked the idea that the country slowly put its most, you know, the, the answer. The, I'll just read it in the words of uh, Karen. The use of Argentina as an example of getting muscles back into 2001 is interesting, mm -hmm. in uh, in light of the recent election. How does the lurch back to the right fit with a picture um, that you both? Our painting of South American politics. I kind of know what I think, but you want to. Yeah. What why do you don't think? You, why don't you? Why don't you go if you kind of know what you think? I think that Millet mm -hmm. is an answer, a very bad answer to the same question that a lot of um, movements around the world have been responding. Um, and this move, the anti-political move, is one that I think that is really central to to my book. Um, and it also relates to the, the discussion we had a second ago, why it was that this particular um, repertoire of tactics became so easy compared to everything else, is that I do think that since the end of the 20th century, there has been a real crisis of representation. People, people believe more or less correctly the governments that are supposed to represent them do not. They respond um, mm -hmm. first and foremost, foremost to, to powerful economic interests. And so globally, since 2000 and well, whenever I'm forgetting when I'm from California, when we elected Arnold Schwarzenegger, but in general, almost every time that I can think of in, in uh, global politics in the last 25 years, the voters have been given the opportunity to say, screw you to the people in power. They usually take it. Now, usually what happens is that four years later, the country says, oh my God, that, that was horrible. And they go back to some kind of a, very establishment figure in California, back to Jerry Brown, the guy who'd been running the state forever. Brazil goes back to Lula. Um, there is, I think there's a pattern where this tends to not work out because it is the wrong answer. And I think it is understandable, again, um, that Argentina would opt for the screw you answer to a body politic that had been put back together sort of but to, since 2001 but not really all the way i mean mm -hmm. if you look at the economic um, situation in the country since 2001 you can you can't really argue that the country is, has moved past this i think it's a tragedy um that has to be fought just like jair bolsonaro had to be fought and in brazil Bra jair bolsonaro was fought with as decimated as they had been as weak as they were in comparison to some of the moments of mass politics in the 20th century that um, both of us look back to in our books. But Bolsonaro was fought with the remnants of parties, organized the, the organized working class, a collective subject, people coming together and making alliances uh, across civil society to do what was necessary to fight. And it was indeed because of like organizations like the PT, the MST, the CUT, the, 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 the uh, Labor Union Federation in Brazil that they just barely got over the line and restored um, at least a leader uh, that believed it's not trying to destroy, to destroy democracy. So this picture, I think, I, you know, I think it's a tough and a good question from Karen, but I do think that the country was like, is still in this process of reconstructing, and and then we still have it has the global, particularities yeah. of of Peronism that are that are very specific, right? So it so in terms of, a, a, you know, a left project more akin to Chile, right? Wasn't really um, didn't really have a chance in Argentina, or or or, or wasn't yeah put forward in the same way. Um, 
But I do think that it points to, I mean, beyond beyond what you said, Vincent, around, um, you know, the chance to say screw it. And really, that should be a very important warning to uh, people in the U.S. Um, uh, ahead of uh, an election where Trump will be offering people that kind of opportunity once again, it looks like, um, you know, never say never. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot of people in Argentina th thought for a while that this was just too outlandish. He was too clownish a figure, um, uh, to, to be possible, but, but, but yeah, don't underestimate the desire to lift the middle finger, uh, to, to the whole political class. Um, also, I think the power of conspiracy culture, um, is, is a huge part of it. And we are seeing this not just at the at the level of national elections, but also at the level of referendums. So the Chile constitution, also Australia just had a constitution that had like a modest that would have provided you know very modest representation for indigenous people. Not really uh, you know in, in Australia's government, really just consultation, but it was just lied about in the same in the way that you know COVID vaccines were lied about, and it was like this is a UN takeover that's going to destroy the country, and you know they used the telegram channels that were developed during COVID to spread vaccine misinformation to now pivot to misinformation about the referendum. So a lot, all this sort of informational infrastructure uh, that I track in Doppelganger that what that that was, you know, some of it pre-existed the pandemic, some of it was much of it was developed during the pandemic to spread COVID misinformation is still there. And now and it's being used in all of these um, uh, electoral contacts, whether referendums or national elections. I think to wrap up, we should maybe look at these these sort of double questions, one from Glass Shank about parasocial relationships. Uh, ha, ha, um, how have parasocial relationships changed people's sense of identity in the age of the internet? And Spencer Ackerman's for you, Vincent, how well has public leaderlessness served the protest movements of the past decade? You know, so I, I mean, I would, the parasocial relationship, um, you know, in a way that, that this speaks to what I was saying about branding um, uh, and the, you know, when we, when we create a brand version of ourselves to represent us on social media, this sort of very curated, very polished version of us, um, we we are inviting people, yeah, to think to think of to think of us as a commodity. And the trouble with branding is that it really is um, an exercise in discipline and repetition. And, you know, this, I think, relates to very much to this discussion that we've been having about uh, the need to learn from our mistakes, right? The need to change, the need to look at evidence and say, okay, that didn't work. Now we're going to try something different. I mean, in many ways, that is antithetical to the logic of personal branding or branding movements, which demand a kind of repetition um, and credit taking in order to succeed. You have to, you know, you, ha you have to keep doing the same thing and you have to say that you did it and you have to get the credit for having done it because that's your business model. That, and, you know, that's how you get the clicks, that's how you get the followers and that's how you monetize you know, and maybe that monetization takes the form of going to foundation and saying, our group did this and give us more money to keep doing it. Um, it's kind of antithetical to the principles of solidarity that build, you know, a broad social movement. Um, but, you know, that, that, but that, then I think there are also questions about the opposite, which, you know, uh, uh, Spencer Ackman's question speaks to about this claim that there are no leaders whatsoever. You know, part of what I'm tracking in my book is the kind of leader by follower count, right, where, where um, you know, a few figures rise up because they're good at social media and then they become, they, they become the de facto leaders. Uh, but you're writing about something that is related, but also a little bit different, which is an ideological commitment to leaderlessness. And the question is, has that worked out? So I would say, um, your di the dynamic that you point to is really important. I'll get to it quickly. The, the ways in which leaders appear, even if you try not to have them. But to answer the Spencer's question directly, I think, how well has public leaderlessness served the protest movements the last past decade? Well in movement one, poorly in movement two. Uh, it had this, the belief that everybody's invited 
this particular, like I said, this this very particular recipe, this explosion, this explosive combination, has done a great job of getting people out in in unexpected ways and in moments which actually surprised government so much that they actually uh, were overthrown. So this idea that the uh, the invitation is extended to everyone, you can come as you are or whoever you are, um, that has been quite effective um, at generating these vacuums that we talk about. Um, what has been the problem, at least in um, when we, one is concerned with a very particular phenomenon around which I build my book, is then what to do with that vacuum, uh, especially because I think that even when there is an ideological, when there is no ideological con- aversion to leaderlessness or to leaders, even when there is no ideological commitment to leaderlessness, nowadays in the era of digital coordination, you're going to have quite a lot of concrete horizontality. That's going, it's going to be the case that there are mass protests with a lot of people that are not in some dedicated organization or believing very explicitly that they're behind this or that movement. I think that some element of leaderlessness, um, some element of horizontality is, is going to be a feature of, um, it's certainly mass protest movements, but a lot of just political resistance going forward. That's just the, the, the structure of our society. But in the moments when you have these very specific vacuums and there's a commitment I did, the to no one's going to ever speak for this. We're never even going to decide who might be the person around which uh, we can organize. Or, you know, many people in the book said that we wish that we had organized well beforehand. We wish that we would have been in an organization with clear goals before the explosion came. That is when there is a very difficult uh, they have, there's a very difficult, uh, a very, it's very difficult to take advantage of, uh, of that, of that, um, of that, of that vacuum. And then, so I only, we only have two minutes left, but this is, there's another good question, which I think get, gets, it. it's really hard. So I'm going to throw it to you, but you can throw it back to me too. Cause it's basically what this person is asking and I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing, uh, is how do you create a world in which everybody doesn't want to give the finger to the establishment? Uh, mm-hmm. how do you. How do you defend very, very, very imperfect, publicly controlled, democratically constructed mm. s- systems while we know that they're deeply imperfect? How do we, how do we, how do, do we, are we stuck in this double game for a long time until we can figure out something new? Are we, are we like defending against worsening conditions, this imperfect form? Or is there a way in which you see a bridge from here to a world in which Everybody will not vote. Yes, yeah, screw you. Uh, whenever given the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I uh, just, I just lost the mouse. Um, I think we should give the finger to the establishment. <laughs> uh, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm just going to say that. I mean, I think that the that, that where this becomes this kind of toxic form of of political doppelgangers is that is that these are very, very right-wing, dangerous figures who are absorbing a, um, uh, uh, a, a, a righteous fury at elite power and are impersonating uh, um, actually being anti-establishment and are in fact committed to protecting uh, capital, a, a, including their own vast capital. I mean, these are almost reliably very wealthy figures who are claiming to be anti-establishment, whether it's whether it's you know Trump or, or Rupert Murdoch or um, you know. It, so you know, I think the way you fight a kind of a, a doppelganger of the left is to have a real left uh, that has a political program that is actually redistributive um, and is not a joke and is not just about uh, um, sort of saying fuck you, but actually about, um, you know, uh, getting a, a huge amount of that ill-gotten wealth and re- redistributing in ways that are going to concretely improve people's lives, um, you know, as a start. And so, and so, yeah, I think the only way you fight these sort of uh, um, uh, uh, synthetic uh, uh, caricatures um, is to offer a real alternative. What do you say? Yeah, so it, sound, it sounds like what you're saying. And if so, then I agree that we need the answer is to give the finger better. You know, uh, don't put down the finger, give the finger to the establishment, but give it better. And at the point at which you're doing, you know, Performing this communicative action of, of screw you, also building alliances with other people that 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 with which you can collectively build a world 
that everyone doesn't want to say screw you to. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Let's give yeah, it, exactly. if that's what you're saying, give the finger from the right direction at right. the same time, but, but don't only do that work, work, work in the background to, to build the connections that will help us to, uh, to do more than that. Uh, if that's what you're, you know, you know <laughs> that's, that's where I come down at least. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that that sounds really good. Um, you know, no, when I say give the finger, I mean actually confront those forces, right? right. Um, I think people have very, very good reason to be angry at the people who've been running the show for a very long time. They've seen their living uh, conditions deteriorate. We are surrounded by all kinds of mass death. Um, and the reason why these figures are so nefarious is because they capture that anger at elite power and then pivot it and direct it towards the most vulnerable, least responsible uh, people in our society. Uh, and so it's a bait and switch. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's a good place to end on a Haymarket seminar to say the same thing we always say, which is we need to rebuild the left. Uh, we need to have a horizon that we're working towards. Um, and uh, we need a world uh, that is not pitting us against each other um, which protects life, um, and uh, that, yeah, we wouldn't want to give the finger to because we've invested it and we built it together. So thank you, Vincent. Uh, it was really a pleasure at long last to have this conversation with you. I hope we get a chance to do it again in the future. Mm -hmm. And thank you, everybody who listened, sent great questions, um, and thanks to Haymarket for being Haymarket. Thank, just want to echo that. Say thank you so much to you and to everybody that made this possible and that uh, gave us their attention tonight. So just truly really thank you. Thanks.